limits, boundaries, borders. When we're children, they're set for our good. So lost. To protect us, to keep us safe. How did something that was meant for our good and our protection, limits, come to define us? Am I good enough? What about my career? Uh, what? Did I lead a good life? When did the limits of someday when become the lid that closed so tightly on our already restricted boxes? Did I love my family or not? I'm never going to be good enough. Am I good enough? When did outside voices, opinions, hurts, and disappointments become the borders that limited our dreams? I was more beautiful. When will I be? Thought I knew my path, but... Yet something inside each of us longs for more for life beyond our limits, for possibilities that are waiting, waiting for you to reach out to seize. So the question is, are you willing to take that step? To trust God as we embark on a journey of limitless influence, limitless opportunity, limitless potential, and limitless legacy. As we trust our limitless God, churches planted, leaders developed, communities transformed, care centers expanded, global outposts established, all while leaving a gospel legacy to the next generation. This is Faith Without Borders. All right, how do you know if you go over to your friend's house and you see that dining room table is all set up really nice. I mean, they got the fine china out. And then you look at your table setting and you see this goblet, the wine glass. And how do you know if that thing's genuine Waterford crystal? Do you know? Just pick it up and you kind of wet your finger and you put it around the edge and you wait for that reverberating sound. If you hear it, it's the real thing. How do you know if, I don't know, your friend and... He's got that watch and he's got that Rolex and he's putting it in your nose and he, you know, he's talking about how he's climbing the corporate ladder, he's making all this money and he's doing this and he keeps sticking it in your face. How do you know if that thing's real? Well, you just look at the second hand and if it's continuously moving around, this one isn't, and, t and not ticking, then it it's a genuine Rolex, man. All right, ladies. How do you know if that cheapskate boyfriend of yours, who when he gets engaged, he, he just gives you the ring, how do you know if it's a legitimate diamond or it's just cubic zirconium? Well, what you gotta do, it takes a little work, but you gotta take it out of the setting and you gotta drop it in some water. If it floats to the top, that thing ain't real. You say, how do I know that? That's the first thing Jody did when I gave her the ring. <laughs> wedges it out, throws it in a glass of water. She's like, and then she said, okay. <laughs> in all seriousness, how do you know if that person that you love, that you care about, that friend, that family member, how do you know if they're a true follower of God? I mean, how do you know? Like, like what's the test? Like, 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 how can you know for sure? Or, or better yet, how, how do you know if you are? I mean, how, how do you know and have extreme confidence that I know where I'm going to spend eternity and I know that God is in my life now? I, how exactly do you know? That's what I want to talk to you about. If you're joining us online, I'm so thankful that you're here. All those in the house, let's give a big amen. Praise the Lord, the goodness and grace. Open your Limitless Guides to page 18. Limitless Guides, page 18. If you're new with us, second week in our series, it's entitled Faith Without Borders. And what we're doing is we're walking through the book of Joshua and we've given you this resource to help you and we're identifying the characteristics of true saving faith. We're identifying the characteristics of a genuine, growing, enduring faith. That's what we're going for. For every single person today, the message is entitled Dynamic Faith. And we're going to take a look at a woman whose faith, I'm telling you, right before our very eyes, it became legitimate, it became real, it became dynamic. Some of us, our faith is dead, I hate to say it. And it needs to be dynamic. And you're going to see a woman that that's exactly what happened. And so I've been praying that that's what's going to happen here today 
is that our faith is just going to get jump-started. And so that's where we're headed. I want to give you several what I'm calling marks of true saving faith. But before we get there, you can see that this book gives you all kinds of information. It gives the notes, uh, a, t a place for you to write notes. You can see that on pages 20 and 21, a place for you to write notes, a place for you to write notes. <laughs> Two pages today, lots come in. It's got the verses in your message titles. There's even a QR code here where you take notes. And the QR code is a place for you to go so that you can get some additional study for you, for yourself, for your family, for your growth group. And then it's got everything you need because we've been on this journey. And again, if you're new, I want to just get you caught up. We started this generosity journey a year ago. It's a 24-month, two-month generosity journey where we want to see everybody grow in generosity. And so let me say it like this. I said it last week. The train has left the station. We are on this journey. The locomotive is going. I'm telling you, God is doing some things, and you can read about it here, but we're heading in a certain direction. But this series serves as a midpoint. Why? Because we don't want you to miss the train, man. And so we're stopping in the middle, and that's what this series is. It's a refresh. For those who are new, they've been asking Pastor Craig and CJ and me, and, and how do I get involved in this? Hey, we got a seat for you. We've saved a seat for you. And so we want you to get on. But then the truth is, and I, I'm not going to hold back, some of you, you've been around and you said, I don't want to get on this train 12 months ago. And for whatever reason, man, the grace, it's all good. Hey, I, I've got doubts at times, and well, what about this? And I don't know about that, and I don't think that. And if that's you, that's okay. But now's your chance because the locomotive is going. This is the stop, and I don't want to be looking back in 12 months when we see God doing all these things. And, and you'd have missed the opportunity to move in the direction that he wants. So good stuff, that's where we're heading. So how do you get involved? The book, it's got all that information in it. I'm not going to spend time on that. But let's jump in on page 18, and I'm going to read the story for you. It's a long one, so hang with me for a moment. And it says, starting in verse 1, page 18, this is Joshua chapter 2. Joshua, the son of Nun, he sent two men secretly to a place that I don't want to say. And he sent them as spies. And he said, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. But then the king, in verse 3, sent to Rahab, saying, bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman who had taken the two men and hit him, she said, yeah, it's true the men came to me, but I don't know where they came from. Oh boy, the nose is growing right there, Pinocchio. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I don't, I don't know where the men went, she said. Pursue them quickly, for you have overtaken them. But she had brought them up to the roof. You can see in verse 6. And so, verse 7, the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone. In verse 8, before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and, and that the fear of, of the Father has fallen upon us and that all his inhabitants in the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the land of the Red Sea before you came out of Egypt and what you did to those two kings. And skip down to verse 11, she says, And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. And look what she says. She said, For we knew the Lord your God, he is God of, in heavens above and on earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me for the Lord that, that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the man said to her, our life for yours, even to death. Okay, if, if you don't tell this business for ours, then, we'll then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let down by a rope, she let him down by a rope through the window for her house was built into the city wall she said to him, go into the hills and pursue the pursuers that will counter you and hide for three days. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless in respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house in the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But 
If a hand is laid on anyone who is in your house, your blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we will be guiltless with respect to the oath that we have made with us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Father, I pray for this story to refine our hearts and our faith. I pray that you would feed us and grow us. I, I know that faith comes by hearing, by the hearing of the word of the Lord. And so I'm asking that you'd speak through me, Lord. I'm asking that you'd speak to us. And I'm asking that you would make it clear to us the steps we need to take so that our faith is dynamic as we see here. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. amen. So I want to give you four marks today of what I'm calling true saving faith for you, most importantly, that you would examine your own heart and that you would be able to properly help others examine their heart. That's where we're headed. So the first mark is this. It's that a saving faith, a faith that saves, is a faith that's received. And so this faith needed to be received. If you look in your books or even look at the screen, the Joshua, he's the new leader. He's the one that is taking the people of God. Moses is gone. We talked about that last week. And he sent these two spies into the land. And so the land represented the promised land. That was the land that was flowing with milk and honey. We talked about it last week. That represented what God wanted as the people had left Egypt in bondage and they had wandered around for the wilderness for 40 years. A journey that should have took four months took 40 years. And so they're finally there. And then this city, Jericho, this is the place that this is a strategic location. They go in there, these two spies to check it out. And then there's this woman and her name is Rahab. And the, the Bible says she's a prostitute. It points that out. We'll, we'll get back to that. But look what it says in the verse. It says that she lodged there. Her house was literally built into the wall. She was on the outskirts of the city, so to speak. And, and so she's on the outskirts. She's kind of in the wall. Why? Because she was an outcast, hence prostitute. So we'll get into that later. And then so what does she do? She gets the spies in. And then the king's men come in verse 4 and 5. If we look at verse 4 and 5... It says that, it says that she, she, she said to him, to the king's men, I don't know where these guys are. Man, I don't know where these guys went. And so here we have the lie. And so we're trying to discern if somebody's a follower of God or not. And we're looking at Rahab and you're saying to yourself, well, is it okay to tell a little white lie? Looks like it is. Well, hold on for a moment. I mean, can you cut the girl a slack? I mean, she ain't even a Christian yet. And if so, maybe for five minutes. I know, I'm sure that you and I have done much worse. But look at the overall objective here. She's trying to protect the people of God. And, and it's interesting to me that, that she goes about it in this way. And, and then so the question we want to answer, really the more important question is, does, did Rahab receive the, the, the truth? And, and the answer Let's vote for a moment. Either you go thumbs up, you go thumbs up, maybe, I don't know. Thumbs down, I see nobody voting. Uh, I see some, some are not sure. Thank you very much. But I, I, I got to tell you, I, I think it's thumbs up. And, and I'm going to not just say that, I want to prove that from the text. And so I think she got it. And so let's look at three verses that give us three proofs. The first is verse 9. Saving faith is received when we know the truth about God. I mean, she knew the truth about the real Lord. She said to the moment, I know that the Lord has given you the land. She was talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She knew she had heard. This is, I mean, she's a Canaanite woman, woman living in a Canaanite city. I mean, these are, this is horrendous what's happening. These people are worshiping these pagan gods and they're offering kids up as sacrifices. I mean, she, she, knew the truth about the one God. And then look at verse 10. Saving faith is received when we believe the truth about God. And so it's got to go from our head, which is just intellectual consent, into our hearts, which is our emotions, and out our hands that, that we live it. I think we see that here. My fear for too many in the church is it's just in their head. It's intellectual consent. This was me for many years but it never has hit our hearts and our emotions. And if you haven't shed a tear for what Jesus did on, for you on the cross lately, 
I'm telling you, you're missing it. Because it goes from our head to our hearts, to our hands, and, and to the choices that we make. And, and so I think we see it there. She believed the truth. She said, for we've heard how the Lord dried up the land in the Red Sea before when you came out of Egypt. And, and what he did to the two kings. Like she knew the stories and she believed that this God was the one who did it. And then how about this? Saving faith is received when we declare the truth about God. And, and that's what we see her doing next. She says, as soon as we heard it, she said, our hearts melted and, and there was no spirit left. And, and again, you can see it went from her head, intellectual consent to her heart, to her emotions. And, and then she said, for the Lord your God, he's the God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. This God. I mean, she's declaring the truth about God. She, she knew these three things, that, that this truth about the Lord, she had received the truth about him. So how do you know if we receive? Well, my favorite verse, probably the most favorite for me, is from John chapter 1, verse 12. And that's a verse that we use around here a lot. It's on some of the walls. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, For as many as received him, it says to them he gives the right. If you receive him, Jesus, he gives them the right to become children of God. So what that's saying is I have this football here, and I'm going to write John 1, 12 on it. What that says is, that not everyone is born a child of God. Do, do you understand? Because we're all, what? We're all made in the image of God, but we're not born a child of God in the Bible according to this until we receive the truth and we believe the truth. And so it's no different than a wide receiver running out for a pass and he has to catch it and he's got to pull it in, got to establish two feet in bounds I just thought I'd get something for that. Nothing here. <laughs> and, 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 and that, you got to receive it. You can't fumble it and drop it or it's incomplete. No, no, I, I got I to gotta grab hold of it and I got to pull it in. So it's no different than this. You know where this is going. Who's ready to receive? I see a guy way in the back. I can't. The thing's in the way. So I'm going to go a little closer. Come on. Yeah, she's patting you on the back. On the, just, yeah, you, you right there. <laughs> Your wife has been hitting you. Are you on your phone? Is he on the phone? Get the phone away. Oh, he's writing the message. Okay, stand up for a moment, please. Stand up. Very good. He's writing. That's good. I, I'm not sure if I believe it. And so all he has to do, come on. Come on, give it to him right there. He pulled it in. That's yours. Yeah, that's very good. That's yours. But isn't it true? Uh, uh, that's all we got to do. We got to pull it in. We got to receive the truth about who Jesus is. And it's no different than that. So the second mark of a person who has true saving faith, it's not only that we receive the truth, but a faith that's received is a faith that's revealed. And so you, you gotta share it, you gotta spread it, you gotta be okay with other people knowing about it. And so again, I'll just ask you to vote. What do we think about Rahab? Did she reveal it? I think so. I, I, I just want to say, I, I think she did. But again, we're a Bible church. I, I want to prove it to you. Let's interact with the text. It's so important. And so let me give you three evidences that I believe from the text. I mean, faith is revealed when we share our faith. And stop for a moment and look at her heart for the lost. Her heart for the people in her family who were pagans who didn't believe the true God. And they were Canaanite. And she said to the guy, she's like, well, please swear to me by the name of the Lord that as I've dealt kind with you, you'll also deal kindly with my father's house. And she's like, I want you to save alive my father and my mother and all my brothers and my sisters and, and, and deliver them from death. And here the picture is of a physical death, yes, but, but the reality of what we're studying today, and we've talked about this last time, is that the land for them represented the promises of God that they would be living in a land flowing with milk and honey that God had delivered them out of bondage and into freedom. And for us, that same bondage we've been delivered out of in Christ, the bondage to sin and shame. 
and, and, and we're being able to walk in freedom in Christ. That's the land, the opportunity to expand God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. That, that's the land for us. And, and so this truth, it not only impacts us for eternity, but it impacts us right now. And so, yeah, she's, she had a willingness to share her faith with others. And then the second proof why I believe that she revealed her faith is because she, she, she had a, she, it, faith was revealed when we defend our faith. I mean, the king, think about this for a moment. The king sends his men in, and can you imagine her knees knocking? And like, what's going to happen to her if she gets caught? I mean, she's going down, man. She's given her life. And so she defends it. And, and, she, and the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. And she's like, even if you not tell the business of ours, then the Lord gives us the land. We will deal kindly in faith with you. She believed it. And, and she defended the truth that they brought. And then lastly, faith is revealed when we live out our faith. And again, it's got to hit our heart, our heads, our hearts, and our hands, our mind, our emotions, and our will mind, emotion, will. It's got to change what we do and who we are from the inward out. That, that's true saving faith. And, and she wanted that for herself. She wanted that for her family. She wanted that for others, just like I want that for you and you want that for other people too. And so that's why we live out our faith. And so here we see her let down the rope through the window for her house was built in the city wall. And so she lets these guys down. I mean, she's risking her very life. If you're taking notes, write this down, please. Faith is always revealed in action. I say this a lot, but it's everywhere. It's all over the Bible. Faith is always revealed in action. How do you know if you got true faith in faith? Well, it's always revealed in action. And so we see that here. We see that in the story of the woman, one of my favorites in in Mark chapter 5, and the woman who was hemorrhaging, she's bleeding, and she's been to doctor after doctor after doctor. And do you remember the story? Jesus comes. She's in this crowd, and she just reaches up, touches the hem of his garment, and the scripture says that immediately she was healed. And then Jesus turns around, and he's like, who touched me? How many people think Jesus knew? I think he knew. And then he said these remarkable words to her. He said, your faith has made you well. Again, it, faith is always revealed in action. I mean, always. So I remember the first um, couple times that I read this story. And um, I, I actually, I literally did this. No kidding. I, I took a red cord, similar to the one that I'm holding here, and I, I just tied it to my rearview mirror. And, and the first time I did it, it was because I read this story and I kind of had the same heart as she did for her family. And I thought, I was like, I was believing God that he would save my family. And so my mother and my father and my brothers and my sisters, and I, I, like we were the first Christians in our family. And, and so I tied this, how silly it sounds, to the window of my rearview mirror as a reminder is what I was believing God for. And, and it wasn't that, I wasn't looking at it to, to say necessarily all about what God would do. It was to remind me of what I must do too. That I needed to pray and that I needed to share and I needed to be bold with the gospel. And then the second time I hung this, I, I look in the crowd and I see some who know this story. I've been with us for a long time and this was in 2006. And I hung this on my rearview mirror because we were in a high school not too far from here and we wanted a church home. And that was the sixth year and we, we were trusting God to give us a building. And there was a building across the street from here that went, we didn't get. And then this building, I was hung this because I was like, I'm trusting that God's going to give us this building. This 107,000 square feet of space that we could turn into a church and that was back in 2006 and 2007, and that was just my reminder, and I challenged a lot of us to do it. And, and I'm standing here because God did it, didn't he? I mean, he gave us this building. Yeah, let's praise him. I say gave. It was going through foreclosure, and for a cheap $7 million, we were able to get in here. But it was a reminder that 
that what am I believing God for? And so I don't, I don't know what you're believing him for, but we've got a bunch of little red cords like this, and so they're to my right and to my left. And at the end of the message, there's going to be a time where you can wear a responsive church with a responsive culture. And so, so maybe you're believing God for something. And may this silly little thing be a reminder to you like it's been to me that God, God is good and God provides and God is faithful. And whether it's that I'm praying or that I'm trusting or, or that I'm responding, and it's, it's reminding me that I need to do something, that what do you believe in God for? Maybe for you, it's like Rahab and it's the faith of a family member or friend. Maybe it's really close and it's somebody in your own home and Maybe it's somebody who's walked away from the Lord that maybe your own child that you want to see him back. That's the reminder that you pray that God draw them. And maybe you're like me and I'm trusting now I'm going to have this in my car for the next year. And, and I'm trusting that we talked about this last week that, that I want to see God expand the borders. And so if you don't have to turn there, but page four and five, it shows what territory, what we want to believe God for is, as we're able to expand the gospel. Because for us, the land represents opportunity for more people to believe, belong, and become like him. And so what is it that you're believing him for? Maybe it's for a restored relationship and things aren't going that well in your marriage or with your family or some extended family. And you're just trusting and you're believing that God's going to heal that relationship with my brother. My sister, I, maybe it's freedom from a particular sin or, or from the past. I, I don't know what it is, but I, I'm believing God for some things in the next season, and I want to be a church that challenges us to do the same. Agreed? Let's move forward and trust him so you'll have a chance to respond. We're trusting him for what he wants and what he sees. So our faith, it's revealed when we live out our faith. Let's look at the next thing is that our faith is not only a faith that saves is a faith that's received. A faith that's received is a faith that's revealed. And a faith that's revealed is a faith that is refined. And so that's what we see next is this refinement is that God's going to refine it and he's using the trial that you're in right now. Please let me remind you of that pain, that difficulty, that diagnosis. He's using it as an opportunity for you to draw close to him and for him to teach you. Maybe it's specifically about dependence on him. That, that that's the reason we go through trials. And so did Rahab go through some trials? Yeah, I think so. I don't think I'm pushing the text too far. I don't think I'm pushing the text too far that say that her faith was refined. And so imagine for a moment when she had this cord in the window and she tied it in her window and, and then her brother and her sister came back and her mother and her father came back and, and, and guess what? They're like, what, what's with the cord? And it says in the text that she waited three days that, before these guys came back, they hid for three days. So day after day, she's like, well, no, these guys came and these two men came and, and God's going to take this land and, and he promised me that he's going to save us and everybody is, and we're in, yeah, right. Can you imagine him saying that? Her saying that to her brother and her sister? Yeah, we know what those couple guys were doing in here, Rahab the... I mean, what must have they thought? And then after the first day and the second day and nothing and nothing and nothing. I don't know about you. You got siblings like that? I do. I mean, her faith was tested. And so our faith is always tested. And so whether it's a difficulty that comes that we need to endure and trust the Lord with, our faith is revealed in action and and it's tested at times. And so I'm thankful for a church. I'm telling you, our church family, where our faith is not only received, but our faith is revealed. And our faith is being refined, and that's never been so clear this past month. Can we praise God for what happened here yesterday with our women? Come on! 
I know you've already talked about it, but let me add my thing. I mean, I was here watching, and the women responded with these cards and these bold faith cards that they want and praying for God to do some things and to show up in a specific way and trusting him and believing him. I mean, that's dynamic faith. And then can I mention the men with no applause? (laughs) Well, they don't deserve it yet. But it was only a couple weeks ago on this very same stage from all of our locations, we packed the house and, man, their faith was revealed. And never so much in their responses, this front was filled. And then even guys got baptized. We had all these people that got baptized. And, and so I want you to just hear the stories so you can be encouraged that we're doubling down on discipleship for families and, and for men, the head of households, and for fathers and And look what it looks like, man. Take a look at this. We haven't showed this yet, but it's so encouraging. Look at this from our men's conference a couple weeks ago. I lived for myself still, even after I was supposedly baptized. There was no change in my life, but (laughs) I'm ready for that change. I've been feeling the Spirit pulling. And today, I was like, I can't wait another day. I went sideways dealing with drugs and selling drugs, making a lot of money, but I wasn't happy. So, and I determined when he was speaking, like, I, I just had to be free. And, and right now, it's like I'm in, at the brick wall, and now I need to be free, so that's why I'm here. Well, I've spent too many days high and not enough days sober. So many days that being sober felt like I was high. Mm-hmm. And uh, I need to break that path. I need to walk down the correct path before that, that life consumes me. Because rather than worrying about what the world thinks about me, I want to spend my days focusing on what Christ has done for me. You know, I just felt isolated, alone. I didn't want to live. I think there was a point where I just, uh, I wanted to you know, commit suicide. I was at that point. So Christ has filled me with hope. I want, I want to step forward. I want to move forward. I want to be a spiritual leader in my home. So, yo, and um, Pastor Robbie, um, you know, I asked us to, like, raise our hand, stand up. Like, the Holy Spirit just, like, tapped on my shoulder. Hey, that's you. So, yeah. yeah. I want more, more, more than this, you know? In the last couple of months, God's been working on my heart in a way that that he's told me that you can't outserve sin. I've served God all over the world. I've baptized people in the Jordan River. I thought that was good enough. I haven't led my family. I owe a huge apology to my wife. I have a seven-year-old son named Barrett that I haven't led the right way. That changes today. I know of Jesus, but I don't know Jesus. Yeah. And and I want to, I've made a commitment to know him and have him really be part of my life. I can't help other people and, and be the leader in my profession and, and to my wife if, uh, if I don't let him break, break my heart. It doesn't matter how far I've gone, he still comes running after me. He has showed me his faithfulness and his love that no matter what has happened in my life, no matter where I've been, what I've done, who I've hurt, who I've affected, um, he's still there. And his prompting, his kindness, his love has just drawn me to the end of myself, to the place where there's no other choice but Jesus. Fantastic. Lastly, a faith that's it's refined is a faith that's rewarded. And so we don't have these two verses in the text. I'm going to call the worship team up in a moment here as they come and we close the service. But 
This was rewarded. Look with me for a moment at verses 23 and 24 on the screen. So the two men come back and, and, and they say, they give the report to Joshua and they say, the Lord's given the land to us. They give it in your hands. And so there's the blessing we see that, that what Rahab did and how she responded, God blessed it not only for her and for her home, but for her house. And so our faith and the steps of faith that we take and the boldness that we show, it can impact so many different people, can it? I mean, it, it can light a fire and get things going and get things moment. She went from dead faith to dynamic faith. And so you may know this, I don't know, maybe you're a student of the Bible. And this girl Rahab, she's talked about very favorably in the New Testament. And so three times her name is mentioned. And so make note of these three times. It's awesome. Yep, this prostitute. Yep, this pagan. Yep. Three times the first time in Matthew chapter 1. And she's literally listed as a distinguished member, as a royal member in the lineage of Christ. Like the Messiah, Messiah Jesus and David, his kingship. And she is in that line. Remember that Rahab was looking forward to the cross and she didn't have all the information we do. She was trusting in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And she was trusting in the Redeemer, the Messiah, the Christ, the Chosen One, the long-anticipated Deliverer of Israel. Again, we know more than she did. But she was looking forward. And now we're looking back. We're looking at the same God, the same God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that sent his son Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, to, to pay a price for us on a cross. And so for the forgiveness that we have and the land that we want to go after, it, it starts in your own heart. And so I love that, man. She is in the lineage of Christ. Second reference, good stuff. James chapter 2, and this one is a little more complicated, so we've got to put our thinking caps on, but she's an honorary example of true saving faith. James, Jesus' half-brother, he's talking about the unique relationship between faith and works, how you can't have one without the other. And the reformers said, a faith alone saves, but a faith that saves is never alone. And I always say it like this, faith, if it hasn't changed you, then it hasn't saved you. And so there's a unique relationship, and she's mentioned as an example in James chapter 2. And then last, we, we see her in Hebrews. I mean, this prostitute? This girl that was running tricks on a city wall? I mean, I mean you kidding me? After all she did, she is on, she's in the wall of faith? But like, she gets in there? But like, Why? I just want to cut it straight. Your past is never an obstacle to God. Your past is never an obstacle to God. How do I know that? Because her past was never an obstacle to God. Because David's past was never an obstacle to God. Ours isn't either. Listen, man, it may be an obstacle to you. Your, fate, your past, it may haunt you and be an obstacle to you about what you've done. It may be an obstacle to some people you love and to some friends around you. I'd even go as far as saying it may be an obstacle to a pastor that you know, but it is never, I repeat, never an obstacle to God. Ever. That, that's what we learned from Rahab. So I'm going to ask us all to stand for a moment. And as we look at the evidences of true saving faith from the story of an unlikely woman, as we look at these examples, I, I want to flip it. And, and so hang with me for a moment. So that's the evidence we see in the text. Let's just flip each one. So for my faith to be rewarded, that's what we want. I want, it, I want you to experience God's blessing. Then it must be refined. So the trial that you're going through, how difficult it is, God's using it for good. He, he's going to grow you and he's going to grow others. And, and, and for my faith to be refined, it's got to be revealed. So let's be a church that's transparent and vulnerable through the difficulties that we're going through. Amen? Amen. And, and other people can learn from the pain that you're in. 
even in the midst of it. You have something to give as you can help others. And then lastly, for my faith to be revealed, man, it's got to be received. It's got to be pulled in. Just like that football, I, I, you got to catch it and you got to grab hold and you got to tuck it away. And so it would be remiss of me if we're going to go on this faith journey but to, to not challenge us to, have you received it? But like, I can't go forward without, have you received it? Like, like, if you're watching online, have you received it? Can you point to a time in your life? And I'm just going to ask all of us here to just bow your heads with me. Please give me a few more moments. And for some, this is the most important time because it's the most important decision. See, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, for all of us on stage, I, I can say it for all of us, there's only two kinds of people. That's it, man, let me cut straight for you. There's only two kinds of people, those who have received the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those who have not received it. That's it. I mean, can you appreciate that candidness? That, that's it. Whoever you lock eyes on, you've either received it or you haven't. And, and, and so, for those who have received it with heads bowed and eyes closed, and you could point to a time in your life when you received the truth about Jesus and, and you understand that he died for you on a cross and you've grabbed hold of that truth. And I'm not saying things are going perfect and man, you need to take a few more steps in the right direction, but you have the faith and you're confident that you have eternal security, that God, God alone saved you, not through what you do, but through what he did on the cross. Just go ahead and raise your hand with heads bowed. Just raise your hand, many hands going up. And, and put those hands up high, they're confident. I'll ask you to just put your hands down. And could you, everyone who just raised your hand, could you begin praying right now for the person in here who needs to make the same decision you have? I just get back from Wheaton at the Protestant Vatican. That was a joke. It's okay to laugh with heads bowed. <laughs> and, and, and we saw people's hands go up to, to embrace Christ today. And this is happening at all of our locations. So with heads bowed and for those who've received Jesus and can point to our time, pray for those to make that decision. If, if you have never received him, I, I want to give you the opportunity. And, and I'm going to slow down. I, I don't want to go through this fast. If you don't have confidence in where you would spend eternity, I, I want you to have confidence. You can leave here with confidence. I remember when I just didn't know. And, and God wants to give you confidence like Rahab. And so if you want to make the decision, I'm not going to ask you to do anything other than just put your hand up. If you want to make the decision right now, just raise your hand so I can see. And I just want to pray for you. I see hands in the back. Just don't be shy. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you that you can be certain. I see hands. And put your hands down. All you have to do is make this decision. And it begins with a prayer. And so pray with me. Father, I know you sent your son to die for me. You sent your son from heaven to pay the penalty of my sin on the cross. And I know that I should have been the one on the cross. But God, you sent your son to take my place. And I admit today, pray this from your heart, I admit that I'm a sinner. That I've done some things that I'm not proud of, that I've I've done some things that I know that you're not pleased with. But I know that, that your son took my place, and so I place my faith and confidence in him. I admit I'm a sinner. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. And I confess him, although I don't know what that is going to look like and all that that means. I confess him as my Messiah, as my Savior for the forgiveness of my sin, trusting that that he's going to live his life through me. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. Let's praise God for his saving grace and for his work even here in this moment. And so now if you've made a decision for Christ, I, I just say that just come forward and grab one of these. And just what do you believe in God for in that next step in your journey? And maybe, maybe you're believing God for something else. We're a responsive church. Come forward, grab one of these. Let this be a reminder of what we are believing God for in this season. Come forward now, grab one. Let's worship together.